in stone. This is a, uh, an extended and elaborated version of the presentation that he gave at IWPT, apparently, where I was amazed that he got through 52 slides in 25 minutes, and that the questioning at the end demonstrated that people actually had kept up with them and really absorbed it. So that's quite an accomplishment. Um, Young is a student at Penn, although he's also doing a lot of collaboration with people at ISI on things to do with KBEST parsing and also um, KBEST approaches in general for things like machine translation and all sorts of things that are near and dear to our hearts. So his schedule is pretty full for today with the MSR fellowship interviews, but he's sticking around tomorrow to talk with additional people, just some sort of sucker for punishment. And if you'd like to sign up with him, just talk to me afterwards. Thank you, Simon. Um, you basically told the guys uh, what this talk is all about, so I don't have much to say. Uh, so uh, this talk, this work is about KBS parsing, uh, basically meaning fast and exact K, uh, KBS Viterbi parsing algorithm. And since I know um, some of you guys are working on machine translation, so I'll also talk a little about, sorry, this little, sorry, uh, about KBEST translation, how to apply these KBEST parsing algorithms in syntax-based machine translation. So first of all, what's KBEST parsing? Well, basically it means given a, given a natural language sentence, say I saw a boy with a telescope, which is ambiguous, you, you at least got two readings. And I not only want the first best uh, interpretation, but also the second best and the third best and through the case best. So that's uh, the task of, task of getting the top K interpretations or uh, structures uh, for a given sentence. That's KBS parsing. So before I talk about any uh, technical details, I, I first want to convince you that it's not a easy task for, for even for human beings because uh, my advisor, Erwin Joshi, uh, was, uh, when he was award awarded the uh, Benjamin Franklin Medal, uh, he was asked to give a talk, uh, basically introductory talk to high school students. Uh, those uh, local Philadelphia kids, uh, because uh, uh, the Benjamin Franklin uh, Association want the kids to understand what Dr. Joshi is doing and what, what like what's natural language processing, what's computational linguistics. But that's really a hard task uh, to teach the kids. But 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 Dr. Joshi found a, uh, a smart way to do that. Basically, uh, just speak a sentence and let those kids draw whatever they have in their mind instead of speaking what instead of uh, telling people what it means in, in, in language. Because the, the kids at their age are much better at, at visual abilities. So there's actually one kid got this for I saw her duck. <laughs> 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 and then the next sentence, I eat sushi with tuna. The same kid got this. So this is a p typical PP attachment problem, ambiguation. Uh, <laughs> And what can we say? Well, basically, your KBS parser is not accurate. There's no reason or no situation that you can get this interpretation to be your top interpretation for this sentence. So you didn't prove your KBS parser. <coughs> uh, OK, back to technical stuff. So, so why is it important, Pran? Because uh, we, we, we often have NLP as a pipeline of uh, several stages or several phases. Uh, say you first do part of speech tagging, then parsing, then semantic interpretation. Uh, and that's often the case that the first best from one stage is not guaranteed to be optimal in the future phases. And what people do is to postpone disambiguation by propagating a k-best list instead of just propagating a first best answer to the next phase. Uh, so that's what people do between, semant between syntactic parsing and semantic role labeling, for example. Uh, well, it's also true that it's widely used in discriminative training, recent methods of uh, uh, machine learning, uh, especially in re-ranking and uh, minimum error training, or uh, perceptron like online learning. Uh, basically, here we use a k-best list, the top k interpretations, to approximate the whole, the full set of uh, all interpretations, which is usually exponentially large. Say, the set of parses for a given sentence is exponentially many, right? But, you use, but most of them are crap. So just use, the, say, top 100 parses to approximate the whole set. And uh, the bet is you get the, 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 the majority, the, the probability mass right. So it's a good approximation. So what people do uh, in previous work, well, the simplest and uh, well, earliest approach attempt to, to do that 
uh, is in Colin's uh, re-ranking paper, where he uh, basically turned off dynamic programming totally, uh, meaning no two items are considered, e no two interpretations are considered equivalent, so that he keeps all the derivations in the chart, which means that is an exponential algorithm. Uh, well, it, how to make it work in practice? So he has to do very aggressive pruning uh, to make it attractable. Uh, and, but as we will show uh, towards the very end of this talk, this pruning has very bad uh, effect on the quality of the output. Uh, so Chuck Yan Johnson did something better uh, recently, uh, which is multi pass coarse to fine grain, uh, but it's still not uh, exact k best. Uh, but uh, so, so ours is exact k best and fast album. But it turned out that there is an earlier uh, a pro earlier paper, which is largely unknown to our community, uh, by two Spanish guys, Jimenez and Marcel, which presented basically very close algorithm to very uh, very much the same to our final algorithm, although we have uh, an improvement, and uh, they tested on the on a on a tiny uh, grammar. Uh, so what our work differs from their work is that first of all we formulated our algorithms on the very general framework of directed monotonic hypergraphs, so that all parsing algorithms that can be captured by this framework can be uh, can be applied for our algorithm. Uh, and then we have uh, four algorithms, four KBAS algorithms, each of which uh, improving the previous one a little bit. And finally, we get algorithm three, uh, which is uh, pretty fast. And we present experiments uh, on state-of-the-art natural language systems, one on the uh, coding speaker style parser, which is a tree bank parser, and the other on the CKY style uh, decoder uh, by David Chen. So, so first of all, what's a hypergraph? When, what's, it, what's the difference between a hypergraph and a conventional graph? Well, the only difference is that in a graph, uh, a, an edge links two vertices, and in a hypergraph, a hyper edge links several vertices to one vertex. And this is very, uh, uh, this is very similar to the deductive specification of parsing algorithms where you have uh, antecedent atoms. And if you have derived all these three antecedent atoms, then you can derive the consequent item. Uh, so this uh, deductive rule is captured as a hyper edge in hypergraph. And so if you're familiar with CKY, this is the CKY deduction. And for example, you can have MP, VP, and you can derive an S. This is an instantiation of the rule, of the deductive rule. And this instantiated rule is basically a hyperedge, uh, where the items in the chart are vertices in the hypergraph. And this uh, deduction is a hyperedge. So this way, hypergraph can be thought of as a compiled version of the instantiation of uh, deductive, speci deductive specification of parsing algorithms. So that's what Kalein and Manny did uh, for logical deduction. Uh, and it's also, it's also the same as the notion of packed forest uh, in our field. So for example, uh, get this sentence, I saw a boy with telescope. There are two interpretations. And how do you compactly represent both of them? Uh, well, that means do you have a method to, to use polynomial space to represent exponentially many parses, right? And that's what packed forest does, basically combining the two equivalent items, basically because these two VPs span in the same range of indices, and they are both VPs, so they are equivalent. And that's the only ambiguous part in this sentence. And that's uh, packed forest. So, so, so we all know packed forest, but if, what if we just rearrange these nodes a little bit, and then we get a hypergraph? So now the nodes are vertices, and these links are hyperedges. So basically, it's, not, not, it's really nothing new. Uh, so, but people also do, in practice, weighted deduction, like PC, probabilistic context free grammars, or as, as such. So we also need to formulate weighted deduction into weighted hypergraphs. So, well, it's also very straightforward. Uh, in weighted deduction, you have, say, uh, a weight or the score, uh, the best score or the best derivation of this item. B and C, and then if you derive the item AIK, then you know the resulting weight is a, the, the result of applying the weight function F to the weights of the antecedent items. And in CKY, it's really simple, just t B times C times the probability of this rule. Uh, but in general, 
uh, in a weighted hypergraph, uh, suppose you have a weight, a deductive, a deduction, and uh, you have a weight function for each deduction, then you can represent it as a hyperedge, but you just have a weight function in this hyper. So, so a weighted hypergraph has a set of vertices, a set of hyperedges, a special vertex called target, basically meaning uh, the goal item. Say, for in CKY, it's S of 1 to N. Basically, if you recognize S for the whole sentence, then you are done. And R is the weight set where your weights are from. And we refer to be a total order set so that we can compare derivations. And your hyperedge is the set of antecedents, that's tails, and the head of the edge, that's the consequence, <coughs> and a weight function. So if you have the weight function for this row, and basically have the same for this hyperedge. So that's formalizing the net half uh, weighted deductive system. But the weighted hypergraph in this way is a little bit more flexible or general than weighted deduction, in the sense that we can have different f, different weight function for different hyperedges. Uh, whereas in the weight deductive system, you, all the weight functions are in the same class, say a times b times c times the, the probability of this rule. So we can have ad hoc weight functions for ad hoc, uh, de ad hoc instantiation of deduction, uh, which is a little bit more general. Uh, so any questions so far? Sure. So this is no longer a CFG then? Uh, this can be more than CFG. Say you have a tag, you can still represent, you have a true joining grammar parser. You can still represent them as a weighted deduction system, deductive system. And any parsing algorithm that can be captured as a weighted deductive system can be formulated as a hypergraph search problem. So, so, so but still, if you're able to wrap everything under A in a single score, that sort of suggests a CFG problem, isn't it? Exactly. So, so this is a very good point. So hypergraph. For hypergraph, you can represent it as a CFG. But this CFG is different from the original grammar CFG because you intersect the CFG with, with the sentence, basically, with a DFA representing the sentence. So that's the, yeah, exactly the same as the Bach-Hillel intersection approach, where you intersect the CFG with a DFA, then you get, still get a CFG because CFG intersected with regular grammar is still a CFG. And the parsing is, can be viewed as a generation problem in that intersected CFG. So there's two different CFG. Yeah, um, I'm sure you're going to get to this in a minute, but um, at this point, what I'm wondering is <coughs> what uh, what uh, score do you put on a hypergraph if you have? Oh, I guess it's it's yeah. What score do you associate not with a not with a node if there are two different uh, hyper edges that have that node as their target? Yeah, so you take the best of them. You take okay, so you yeah. use of a turby. Yeah, use of it. But I'll, I'll cover that in, in, in several slides. Uh, there might be other applications where you want to take some. I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 the, so the yeah. So here we only care about the comparison, basically to take it better. But in Semarine, uh, you can have the sum operator, which you can take the inside, for example, right? So here we only care about. Uh, the optimization problem. So we have the total order set. So, okay, so, so we talk about the weight function a lot, and we have a very critical assumption that all the weight functions in our framework must be monotonic on each of their arguments. What does that mean? For example, in CKY, F weight function is B times C times the probability of this rule. And this is, of course, monotonic on both B and C argument. Uh, but in general, <coughs> this requirement formalizes the optimal subprime property in dynamic programming. That is, if you want to apply dynamic programming, you have to have the optimal subprime property. That means if you can decompose a large problem A into B and C subprimes, B and C, and, you, uh, and you, if you have something better for the subprime B, so if you have a B prime, uh, which is better than the original solution, then by applying the monotonic weight function F, you can always get something better for A as well. Uh, in other words, if you claim something, if you claim this is the best solution for A, then the, the solution for B and C must also be the best for the subprimes as well. So that's the optimum sub-property. Uh, now, uh, as we have hypergraphs, now the k-best problem are very easy. Just basically find the top k derivations of the target vertex t. Uh, in CQYT, it's very easy. Uh, another 
critical assumption is that we only care about acyclic hypergraphs so that we can have a topological sort uh, among the uh, vertices and we just proceed along the topological ordering. We know that CKY, of course, is acyclic. Uh, and a lot of the parting algorithms uh, are, are acyclic. So now we come to algorithms. So we have four algorithms uh, from naive to, to, to lazy. Uh, but before I talk about any k-best <coughs> algorithm, I first want to have some basic idea of uh, generic first best Viterbi algorithm. So, so, so we call it g g generic Viterbi algorithm, but it's basically extending the original Viterbi on the hypergraph. So uh, basically, you have a topological sort, first do a topological sort on the hypergraph, and then proceed in the topological ordering. Basically, for each vertex, for each incoming hyperedge, you, you take the result of this hyperedge uh, using the weights uh, of the antecedent items, F and B, A, A and B are the weights of U and W. Uh, just to remind the intuition behind it, think about CKY, these U and V and U, V, W are items in chart. So if you have another hyperedge, you take the better of this. That's what Bob says. And you have more, you take the, bet, better, you take the best of all these results of all these hyperedges. And that's the uh, linear, uh, that's the, the complexity is linear in the number of hyperedges because you visit each hyperedge once and only once. And as a special case, CKY for Chomsky normal form is cubic times the number of products. And this number is exactly the number of hyperedges in the hypergraph. And that's why CKY is cubic. So CKY being a special instance of the generic first best Viterbi algorithm. Okay. So, well, that's really nothing new because dynamic programming has been around for more than 50 years. So what I presented before uh, is really <laughs> nothing new. But, but what these guys, uh, the inventors of dynamic programming, doesn't know is k-best uh, dynamic programming algorithms. Well, the, the easiest approach that extending the first best of Turby to k-best is simply uh, replace a vector, well, replace the weight a and b to be a vector of k guys. and. Uh, if you maintain them to be sorted, then A1 uh, will represent the first, der the, the best derivation, the best weight for A, and AK, the case best deri the der derivation weight for A. Okay, so now A, S, and B are both length K. Now the question is, what's the result of applying the weight function F to these two vectors? Well, the weight function is not defined that way, because weight function is defined only on two numbers. <coughs> now you have two vectors. Well, uh, if you have two, two vectors and all the possible a i and b j is a possible uh, solution, is possible element for, uh, when applying f to a a s and b's. So basically, uh, you have k square possibilities, and then you want to select the top k among them because because you only were, you're only interested in the the k best derivation, the top k derivation for this v. So you don't need the, 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 all the k square guys, right? So basically, you enum enumerate all the k square guys first, and then do sorting or selection, basically, to get a top k. So that's what we say, multi-k equals top k of all the ai, bj, right? OK, so that means you have uh, at least k square amount of work to do. But that's not, 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 not all, because <coughs> when you have another hyperedge incoming, then you basically want to take the better of these two. But now you have k guys here and k guys here. And now this step is easy, easier because you know these k guys are sorted and these k guys are also sorted. So just take the top k among the two k guys. Uh, that's <coughs> linear. That's, you can do a merge sort like thing, which is linear. But simply computing the multi k is k squared. So this is no good, no better than k squared. So that you have uh, that means you have a k square overhead uh, for each hyperedge, right? So your, 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 your overall complexity <coughs> is k squared times e. This is really bad because in practice, you want k to be very large, say, a thousand for translation. Or if it's something you may want 10,000. For parsing, you may want 100. So that means <coughs> this k squared will kill you. Any questions? So we can do something slightly better <laughs> because uh, the worst thing about the previous algorithm is you, you enumerate the k square guys first. But you really don't, want, don't need to do that because you only need the top k guys. 
And remember that A's and B's are sorted, and the void function f is monotonic. That means A1, B1 must be the best of all these k squared guys, right? And then what about the second best? Well, it must be either A1, B2, or A2, B1. It cannot be anything else, right? And then what about the third best? So, so here is a demo. Uh, so you have four guys for A, four guys for B. You know that this guy, A1, B1, must be the first best. And the second best must be either these two guys. <coughs> and s since 24 is better than 20, you know, this guy is the second best. And what about third best? Well, it must be among these three guys. Basically, you have a frontier <coughs> of candidates for the next best. And each iteration, you take uh, the best of these candidates and then replace it with the two shoulders or successors. Why do you need to add the point six? Which one? This one, right? Yeah. So, so, yeah, there's a better way to do that. So you, you say, okay, when I replace the 24, I only actually need to replace it with the uh, 18, right? Uh, 16, right? But, but that, that requires a little bit more uh, work, uh, a little bit more, I mean, uh, improvement. But, but the, 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 the general way is just, just, replace, just replace it with the two shoulders. You, I mean, you are guaranteed to get the best answer, although your way is a little bit better. But uh, yeah, actually, it improves the constant a little bit, but not the complexity. So it's a very good point. Uh, yes. Now the third best is 20, and you replace it with the top two, the two shoulders. And now 16 is already in the heap, so you don't push it again. You just push the, 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 the uh, 15. So you basically keep a heap, or a priority queue, or whatever priority queue you, you, you would like to, to, to maintain the candidates. So this way, it's k log k, because you only need k iterations. Each iteration, you pop one guy. And you can stop when you find <coughs> the, the k's best. Right? You, only, you don't even need to worry about what's here, what's here. You, you don't even calculate them. And you need log k to maintain the heap in each iteration. So it's k log k for each hyper edge. So it improves. But if you keep track of which ones you have popped up, you know, it's only k, right? K. Uh, what do you mean? If you, if you don't. Uh, you only pop up the, so you, you keep track of the ones that you popped up in each list, mm -hmm. and you only compare them to the head of the list each time. Yeah, but you need to, first of all, you need to, to extract the best of uh, the heap. Right, so you, if this is just like you merge two sort of lists. Right? No, uh, no. So this, in, this candidate right. is not sorted. Yeah, you, you just maintain a heap of priority queue, and get the top one is log k time. So. So that's a bit, excuse me. So um, still not the best because uh, we're doing a lot of waste of work because uh, we calculate in the previous M1, we calculate the top gate from each hyper edge, right? But we really, what we really need is uh, the top K for this vertex. At the end of the day, you just, you don't even need to know all these K guys. If you just can get the top K for this vertex, then you're you're good. Uh, so instead of doing them sequentially, each, uh, uh, can we do them simultaneously? So of course, uh, by the same, same idea, you now you know that, for example, this vertex has three hyper edges. And each hyper edge, you, you know, there's a square as before. Now you know that the first best of this v must be one of the first best of each hyper edge, right? Uh, so here, k is 2, meaning uh, you only top 2. And d is the degree or incoming degree uh, for this vertex v. So d is 3. In the case when d is larger than k, you can throw away uh, the, the useless hyper edges. So here, the 32, the worst of these three guys, is never going to be used in, uh, in the top two uh, candidates. Because so we know that among these three guys, this is the, this is the third. So this guy has no chance to get into one of these two slots. And all these guys in this square are no better than this guy, or worse than this guy. So if this guy has no chance, and all this square has no chance at all, so just delete it. Now you have two guys, right? You know that this 42 is the best. And what's the second best? 
Well, as before, it's among these three guys. Basically replace this with the two shoulders. But now you have an item level heap. You have a kind of more global heap instead of a hyper uh specific heap. And you still do the same thing, like extract the best and pop two. And now you have the second best. OK, now you are done. Then you, only, you don't even need to worry about all these guys. You don't calculate them. So this improves uh, a lot significantly <laughs> from the, the previous item, but still not perfect. Because we're still calculating the top k translate, the top k derivations for each vertex. But at the end of the day, we only need the top k, trans top k derivations for the target vertex. Right? So why bother to calculate, to, to waste time for intermediate vertices? So, so take a step further, and you notice that the progression from algorithm 0 to algorithm 2, the central theme is that we delay the calculations until, until really needed. That, that means we are lazier and lazier. That's really kind of on-demand computation. Uh, and we have larger locality. So algorithm 1, 0, we, we, we look at each hyperedge at a time. Algorithm 2, we look at all the hyperedges in coming to one vertex. And in algorithm 3, we look at the whole hyper hypergraph at a time. Okay. So, <coughs> okay. So algorithm 3, the lazy offline algorithm, has two phases. The first phase is forward, uh, basically do a normal first best search until uh, the final item. And this is nothing different uh, or very similar to the first best Viterbi algorithm. One thing different is we construct a hypergraph of packed forest along the way. I mean, in, in conventional Viterbi, a first best Viterbi, you don't need to, to keep, keep track of the, the non-optimal back pointers. You, you basically keep the best back pointer for each item, right? And can throw away all the alternative back pointers. But now, uh, f in order to recover the second best or whatever, you need to uh, store the alternative hyper edges to each vertex. Time complexity-wise, it's the same, because you, you, you visit these hyperages anyway. Right? And the recursive backward phase starts by asking the final item, what's your second best? And the final item cannot decide at this time, because it, it has to ask its parents, and basically propagating the question to, 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 to grandparents, and blah, blah, and to the leaves. And then once you get the second best, you, know, you ask, what's your second, third best? So, so here's the demo. So, S17 is, uh, as I said, is final vertex or target, and has three uh, hyper edges. Uh, and in, in the uh, first best phase, you know this hyper edge <coughs> is the first best. OK, that, that's you already know. Now, K is 2 and D is 3, you, you can as well just throw this, the worst hyper edge. Right? Basically, nothing here will gotta make a slot into these two slots. Um, now, you start by asking the question, what's your second best? Well, uh, so basically, it's m either this one or the second best among, along this hyper edge, right? So, so or the same, same as asking, what's your successor on this hyper hypergraph? Well, it must be either these two guys as before. So you know that uh, my second best must be among these three guys, just as the same as in algorithm two. But, uh, question? Sorry. Yeah, but the critical question, the critical point is, you don't know these two guys yet, because in the first best phase, you only know the first best of each item. That's the difference from the the the, the, the algorithm two. Algorithm two is forward, so you know all everything. Now, what can you do? Uh, but well, because I don't know the second best of MP13, then I basically ask the same question to 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 my parent as, as well, right? So I ask, what's your second best to these three, to these two guys? And they will propagate this question to the leaves. So, so, so maybe I misunderstand, but I don't see how this is different from doing a star search. Okay, great. So, so in speech world, people do this backward uh, uh, in uh, for for the top the top k derivations, right? But in the the difference between speech world and our parsing world is that the speech world is largely finite state. So, so the in underlying structure is a graph instead of a hypergraph. And now, b because we're doing parsing or syntax-based translation, we have a hypergraph where you can combine, or basically an end-all graph. Basically, we can com combine two vertices. Uh, it's not like one vertex can point to another vertex. Several vertex point to ver one vertex. So you have a problem of combination, which is here, like a square, so that you combine AI and BJ. That's not in the speech world. 
It, not in the A-style. I don't think finance has anything to do with it. Uh, um, you know, so, so you're when you do the forward backward pass, mm -hmm. uh, when you do n best extraction using a star algorithm mm -hmm. for HMMs, right? Mm -hmm. um, you you have a forward pass one best, you have a backward pass one best. Actually, no, you just do the backward pass one mm -hmm. best, and that gives you the optimal continuation from every point to the end of the to the end of the graph. Mm -hmm. And then when I when I start asking, okay, so what is the next best? Mm -hmm. You have all those partial hypotheses in the stack, mm -hmm. pretty much what you have here. Mm -hmm. And then I say, okay, well, give me the next one. And yeah. uh, I, I really, maybe we can take it offline, but yeah, yeah. it seems that they're very similar. Yeah, the, the idea is similar. Basically, we're extending it to 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 the world of hypergraph, where you, I mean, basically, you have combinations, which, I mean, is not in the case of. Yeah, well, each combination is a hypothesis that's going to be in the stack, in the star stack. Um, well, that means you transform the hypergraph into a, a conventional graph. In, the, in beforehand. Well, sure. I don't know. I mean, a hypothesis can just be a hypergraph. No? Uh, yeah, maybe we can take, take it offline. But, um, OK, so yes, now recursion goes up to leaves that by propagating the same question, what's the second best? And then it will basically backward reporting the numbers of second best to, to these two items. And now you know the second best of now, now you know basically you know all these three candidates, and now you can say, okay, this is my second best. And if you want more, then you can ask more, what's your third best? So this is the the idea of algorithm three. Uh, so so here's there is an alternative implementation suggested by Jason Eisner. Uh, basically, in the forward phase, uh, I, I, as I said, in forward phase, you have to keep all the hyper edges. You have to construct the whole hypergraph. But sometimes your search space, your hypergraph is too large, especially for translation, for example. Then your memory is not sufficient to do that. But we can, we can do something clever. We can only keep the best hyperedge as in the normal one best Viterbi. But the, the, the backward phase uh, the recover all the other hyperedges on the fly. So when you ask this final item, what's your second best? And it only has the best hyperedges, hyperedge but it can recover the alternative helper edges. Uh, although this is really a waste of time because you, you, you already visited these hyper edges in the forward phase. You, you're basically doing it again. Basically, it's trading uh, time for space. So you yeah, then ask this one, and it can recover hyper edge, all the hyper edges. OK, so here's a summary of uh, uh, time complexity of these algorithms. We start from the first best algorithm, which is linear in the number of hyper edges. And then naive algorithm is k to the uh, k to the a, where a is the array uh, in CKY is two because it were binary uh, doing binary grammar. Uh, and algorithm one uh, improves it to k log k, but still multiplicative overhead. Algorithm two uh, is a dramatic improvement because it improves the multiplicative <coughs> overhead to an additive form, right? And algorithm three. V there mean the vocabulary of the sentence? No. Uh, sorry, V means uh, the word number of the oh, word. Is, yeah, basically it's uh, how many items do you have in the chart. Right. So no, number of non-terminals times n squared because you have two indices, right? And, uh, 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 like VP17. And E is number of hyper edges. And D is the size of derivation. Basically, how many nodes you have in the tree. In the, in the part tree. It's linear in the end because if you have a sentence of n words, then you have uh, the, the tree is also size of size linear to n. Algorithm 3 improved from algorithm 2 uh, basically by changing this v to d. And d is really, really small, it's uh, like linear, and this e is cubic. So in practice, this e really dominates. That means as long as you don't have very, very, or you, until you have very large k, your, the complexity is still. Uh, not much different from a single best search, which is order E. So, and locality is uh, from hyperedge to the global hypergraph for all uh, through all these algorithms. Okay. So, 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 sorry. So, so, so if I look at algorithm two versus algorithm three, two, two versus three. So it's still E that dominates. Mm -hmm. right? And so the, yeah. From two to three. 
Yeah, it's only the, 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 the overhead, this part. Because this E, you cannot do anything about it. I, even in first best, you have to do this E anyway, right? So this E is uh, kind of inherent in, in, in the problem. You yeah. cannot improve any, it. So it's still cubic time. It's still, of course, because we're doing something more. We're doing k best parsing. Parsing is cubic when we're doing k best parsing. We basically want to minimize the overhead. And we cannot improve the, the parsing algorithm itself. So, so that's, that, yeah, that our objective is only to make like computing the top assigned parses not much different from computing the first best parse. So that's what we'll be showing in the experiments. So we have two experiments. Can I, can I question, question. So, in the forward pass, are you still storing only the k-best uh, hyper edges for each target node? Uh, you mean algorithm 3? In 3, yes. Uh, yes. We store, be, because we only need the k, top k, we only store the top k hyper edges. Although we can store all the hyper edges, then that be the generalized JM, JM algorithm, which is a little bit different. A little bit slower than ours, but it's not much slower. You can store all the hyper edges. And uh, so does the k log k come in because of the, uh, that's the cost of keeping, of maintaining the heat? Right. Yeah, all the k log k comes in maintaining the heat because the essential idea among all these items are very similar, just maintaining the heat both. So what was, what, what's little d? Then? Oh, d is the in degree of inc incoming degree. That's how many hyper edges do you have? Uh, basically, yeah. So in, in case where D is much larger than K, then, then we are much better than the generalized Jimenez and Marcel Um Okay, so experiments. So first, the coding spical parser uh, on the pantry bank. So we implemented our algorithm 0, 1, and 3 on top of the Bikel parser and recorded average wall clock time um, for per, per sentence uh, on section 23. So, so here the, the x-axis is k. So this means like computing the top uh, top sound parses, uh, and this is time. So, so we see that, can, and this is log scale by the way. So, so three is much much faster than one, and one is much faster than zero. And three is nearly kind of stay the same because the complexity is e plus d k log k, where e dominates the time for computing the first best parts is nearly the most of work you have to do. That means we have very little overhead computing the second best, third best, fourth best. Is there a reason you didn't run two? Uh, because, yeah, because, because two uh, <laughs> is intermediate and use a lot of memory. Uh, and memory-wise, two, two is, is, is bad, actually. Actually, we didn't, I, I made a slide of uh, space complex, complex comparison. Actually, algorithm three is more space efficient than algorithm one because uh, oh yeah, we'll take it up later. So, uh, what is the average sentence length there? Average sentence length is like twenty-three in the chip band. Twenty-three words. 20, Twenty-two, twenty-three words in chip band. Second twenty-three. It's like uh, distributed from one to sixty-five. The, the maximum length is sixty-five, but most of sentences are less than forty words long. So, uh, so besides efficiency, we also talk about uh, <coughs> accuracy. Because our search uh, is more efficient, we, we can use less pruning, uh, and uh, the quality of the output will be a little bit better than uh, the naive methods. That's our hope. So, so we compare our core re-ranking results um, to, to measure the quality of our op output. So what I just talk about what's our query ranking. Basically, uh, if you have a first best for one sentence and, and compared to golden standard in the tree bank, it might be like 89% accurate. And if you relax it to the top k parses, in the, the oracle, the, the best may be 96, and you also get something very bad. So oracle ranking meaning pick the best parse uh, according to golden standard. It's kind of cheating because in real ranking, you don't have the access to the golden standard. You basically uh, just, ha just compare these guys and pick one say maybe this guy and so so but our rank also makes sense because it's the upper bound of any re, re ranking system and also uh, if you get good for our ranking then you have the potential to get good real ranking results so this is the uh, Oracle re ranking curve uh, we compare ours 
uh, our curve is this line. Uh, compared to Chuck and Johnson, uh, we, this uh, dots, and this is coding uh, to sound reaction paper, and this is Rand Parkey's uh, earlier parser. So, um, so Chan Yak's all above us because they start from a different parser, where the first best of Chan Yak parser is already 1.5 percent, 1.5 percent higher than Coding's parser. Mm -hmm. So it's really uh, not a good comparison. So the the real comparison is between uh, ours and the Coding's because they are based on the same parser. So it, we see that as k goes larger, uh, our curve still still improves. That means we can get better and better uh, from from larger and larger k bus list. <coughs> but Koenig's curve converges at around 50. And the reason <laughs> is explained in this slide. So so another plot is done uh, by, by by drawing the average number of parses for sentences of given sentence, given length. For example, this this guy is uh, so this point it means uh, on average, how many parses do you get for a sentence of 30 words long? Okay. So intuitively speaking, as sentences gets longer, you get more and more parses. Actually, it's ex exponentially more parses as the sentence goes longer, right? Um, then why does Koenig's curve actually drops off after like 40? So so it should go 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 higher. And basically, um, <coughs> the bow curve it goes higher, and we have a k equal 100, so it cannot cannot exceed this ceiling. So uh, the reason why Cohen is, is like this is because he has the uh, very aggressive pruning in the first slide. So what he did is uh, a, a hard beam width, uh, no sorry, a hard cell, cell limit that is only at most 100 items can be in a, in a chart cell. A chart cell meaning, uh, uh, meaning all items with the same span. So all MP or VP from one to seven. So um, that way, he prunes a lot of uh, potentially good parses, and at the end of the day, he has difficulty recovering a parse, recovering a good parse. And in some extreme cases where sentence is extremely long, like 40 words, 60 words, he cannot recover any parse at all. That means get no parse. So that's zero. So. I think historically people used to report precision and recall on sentences less than 40 exactly. words, right? Yeah. So that would explain this. Exactly. So, so yeah, that's correct. So, so this part of the corpus is only 7%. So Cohen's got the majority right. Majority, not, I mean, not as good as ours, but not too bad. And if you see the very short sentence with less, less than 10 words, these two curves actually match exactly well. Very well, right? That means for short sentences, because the 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 pruning doesn't doesn't do that much wrong. So so I mean, uh, it's good. But as soon as it gets longer and longer, the pruning effect becomes more apparent. It would be interesting if you plotted just below here the, the <coughs> distribution function, the uh -huh. cumulative distribution on sentence length, just to see how much of the corpus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A very interesting those. idea. Yeah. So the majority of the corpus of the pantry bank will lie between 20, between 20 and 30 words on so yeah but 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 let's also suggest that Koenig's re-ranking results uh, did worse on very long sentences but yeah so so his less than 40 words result is much better than the whole others. so now we shift to machine translation so so here is uh, our, uh, so here, David Chen implement these algorithms on the higher decoder, um, algorithm two and three, and this is the average decoding time, excluding the first best part, which is the dominating part. So these two curves uh, also, I mean, reconfirm our parsing result. Uh, but what is more interesting is how do you use KBS translations in machine translation? So there are uh, at least two applications, for example. In, in the Hyro system, David uses uh, 100 best translations basically to tune feature weights because he has a log linear weight model, uh, say language model, translation model, length penalty, blah, 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 
like say ten features, and how, how do you, he how does he tune the weights and uses the minimum error training or max blue training by Frank by Frank Zock, which requires a k best output. So that that's one application, and the other is uh, in the ISI syntax based translation system, uh, where I worked for the summer uh, for for the past summer for an internship. So so their way is. Uh, so their problem is they have difficulty integrating the Ngram models in the search, in the decoding part. So an easy approach is to just do the decoding with translation model only. And they, they get, say, they, for example, output 25 sound best translations using our algorithm. And then rescoring re or re-rank these 25 sound translations with a trigram model. So this helps a lot. So their baseline translation model only decoding is 24 point four five. Does that include a syntax-based language model? No. Uh, there's no language model at all. It's just translation model. Uh, as the, since the evaluation metric is blue, if you don't have n-gram models in, to smooth the output, you get really miserable output. If you do a trigram ranking on the, 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 the 25 best translations, you suddenly get 10% of 10 group points group. That's very really significant. But still, this is not perfect, because uh, you prune away some potentially good translations during this search, this, this stage of search, <coughs> so that later on, although you have so many translations, none of them is, is good. Then you, you, don't, you, you don't have a way to recover uh, uh, using the trigonometry ranking. So the better way to do it is to integrate Angular models in the search, which sorry. So, what is the oracle there? Our, our? Oh yeah, we we don't have oracle. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a very good question. We I I don't know the the result of their oracle, uh, which I would guess some forty or something. I I, I don't I don't really know their number. So you guess forty? I yeah I cannot tell. It's not trivial to do an oracle in this because you can't do it by picking just. Or you, you can't do it a sentence at a time. Because if the blue gives zero is the pure missing, you don't have any four groups like that. It's really messy. Chris, Chris <laughs> has been has just been He's struggling. Has been trying some you know, approximations to find the score. Okay. Um, so so if you <coughs> integrate the Angram model Chagrin model using a so 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 here's something that's not actually in this talk, which I mean if you, you guys are interested in talking to me, I would talk that how do you integrate angular models in the syntax based translation system, which is also very difficult for for Chris Quirk's system here. Uh, so the naive binarization way, because you have to use the CKY uh, decoding the CKY parsing algorithm, so you have to do to, to binarize the grammar into some binary binary form. Naive binarization uh, we got this, which is better than trigonometry ranking. And what I did uh, in ISI is synchronous binarization uh, with trigram. Then you get 38.4. Uh, if you compare to Franz Zox's implementation uh, at ISI, so that's what uh, ISI uh, submitted for the NIST evaluation entry. Uh, that's alignment temperature template approach. That's 37. So then it's the same. So, so is this before the bet between Daniel Marku and uh, Franz Bock? Yeah, that's because, because he lost that bet. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, exactly. So, so, so in this evaluation, the the main entry uh, that ISI submitted is this number. Is this this alignment temperature approach? Then their their trigger, their syntax system is like this when when the the NIST evaluation. Mm -hmm. And this is, these results are before. Um, so th this is work you did last summer. No, this which, past summer. This past yeah, summer, yes, which is after the last evaluation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Also, that's Franz's system that he left behind at ISI, not his new system right. at Google. Yeah, exactly. So this is the last update uh, when he left. It's the stage when he left ISI. So you think they're going to swap the shirts next time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, so that means in the. In I'm, I'm afraid 200 billion words of uh, target language training data is worth more than a. What yeah, a exactly. So maybe not. Yeah, I mean, if you have the same amount of resources, 
then we, we, we did beat friends last season, but it's not. <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, this is the, the, the current, my current research. Uh, so okay, so to wrap up, uh, we, we, we first formulated a monotonic hypergraph formulation, which is very general, and defined the k-best derivation problem. And because the, the, the framework is general, then we can make it widely applicable to uh, a lot of problems, say, syntax-based MT. And we have k best algorithm, which the last one, the final algorithm, is pretty fast. And our experiments show that not only the efficiency has been improved, but also because you can do a more effective search, your accuracy is also improved. So uh, for a little bit of future work, uh, so all this talk is about k best Viterbi algorithm, where you proceed along uh, fixed ordering, uh, fixed acyclic ordering. But we can also do k best A star, uh, which, uh, say, for example, uh, Dan Klein has an uh, A star parser, and we can make it a k best A star parser. And this is also very, uh, this is of great interest in the machine translation community, because I know uh, some people are already trying to do uh, k best A star decoding uh, for machine translation. Um, no, not not a star, k best a star, but they they're doing a star decoding for machine translation for the syntax-based systems. Other people have done a star decoding for phrase-based system, but that, as I said, that's basically a finite state world, uh, which is a graph. But a star for for syntax-based or for the tree world is is based on hypergraph, so that's a bit different. Uh, and we are formalizing dynamic programming, the optimization part. Uh, into the hypergraph search problem because we have the monotonic weight functions, which is, which is saying the, the, the optimal subprime property in dynamic programming. And we have to do real re-ranking uh, to show that uh, whether this Oracle improvement really pays off in real re-ranking. So, so Chanyak, is, uh, Chanyak already implemented our algorithm 3, uh, and they are also doing re-ranking with larger k. Basically, because now you have very, very, uh, you have, uh, say, Assad translations, then you cannot use the like max entropy re-ranker. You have to use uh, an online re-ranker, say, perceptron algorithm. Uh, so otherwise, your memory isn't efficient, isn't, isn't sufficient. OK, so that's basically it. I think people might uh, probe you more in the discussion afterwards. Right. I know that you're lined up to have lunch with Jim here. So, thank you. Yeah, so we have a recommendation of algorithm one, which I did the same with it, which I can't remember because it was more straightforward, but um, yeah, I'm not saying that actually algorithm three is the same problem. Am I supposed to have lunch with him? So it's an interview lunch, you can go outside. Uh, uh, and, and that's at uh, noon? Well, from the end of this talk. From the end yeah, of this talk. I told him that if he finished earlier, it would increase the probability that he would take him somewhere interesting. Right. <laughs> so we have to be back by what?